Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank the organizers of EHDN and the Movement Disorder Society for giving me a chance to tell you about my, um, my work and my vision about current and future treatments for Huntington's disease. The title of the talk is a little bit different from what was on the program. I decided to focus on the gene-directed therapeutic strategies, current and future with an emphasis on highlighting some of the complexities that the field at large still needs to focus on in order to develop effective therapies for, for this disease. Let me just start that um, I think everybody attending the course already is familiar with Huntington's disease. It's unique in the sense that a single mutation in a single gene leads to, over time, significant alterations in specific circuits in the brain, most notably the basal ganglia, leading to movement disorder that we call Huntington's disease. So the goal is really how to stop the damaging effects of the mutation on the patients. Um, I wanted to start uh, the conversation by reminding people that the disease evolves uh, very early on, at least 20 years prior to clinical diagnosis. And just wanted to highlight that th there's been a lot of characterization of the manifest phase of the disease. And um, in terms of the progression uh, markers of the disease in the pre-diagnostic phase of the disease, um, including um, you know, structural MRI, uh, some imaging, including PET, PD10, and D2, and more recently, CSF analysis of various markers that shows that the disease um, um, starts uh, uh, being visually manifest with these techniques for about 20 years prior to onset, and therefore that gives us a lot of room to potentially intervene prior to the clinical diagnosis. I think this also shifts the conversation from the current clinical trials, which are all done in the manifest population to a prodromal population in the future. And I think we need to keep in mind that there are significant challenges associated with going earlier and earlier in the disease, uh, even though we think that the timing of intervention is going to be critical for the potential success of these therapies. Another uh, introductory slide showing you that everybody knows that about 55, 60% of the variance on the motoric age of onset as diagnosed by neurologists um, can be explained by the, um, the CAG length at birth, meaning if you do a genetic diagnosis of Huntington's in blood, you will see a certain length of the CAG repeat. Um, and that largely explains the future age of onset, but not entirely. There's a, a significant residual variance that can be explained by other genetic or environmental factors. And this is highlighted here by the fact that you have individuals with the same CAG length, in this case 42, that can develop the disease um, uh, clinical features either in their early 20s or in their early 60s. And a lot of work has gone on over the last uh, decade or so to try to identify uh, additional contributors of these progression uh, stages um, other than the length of the CAG in the Huntington gene. And I think, um, you know, the papers listed here below, and uh, I'm assuming somebody's already talked to you about this component, but uh, through large genome-wide association studies uh, of about 9,000 cases uh, so far, have identified a group of genes whose um, sequence changes either are causal or significantly correlated with changes in the age of onset, motoric age of onset. And it so happens, as is unique in biology sometimes, that a lot of these genes form part of a network of genes implicated in DNA repair. And uh, lucky for us, they have been previously associated in the mouse with controlling the rate of both germline as well as somatic CAG expansion, meaning that these genes um, enable uh, somehow biochemically the stochastic expansion in the CAG length um, in post cells, including neurons of the brain, and that the loss of function of some of these genes, for example, MSH2, MSH3, MLH1, significantly abolishes somatic expansion. So the hypothesis at the moment is that one is born with a certain length of the CAG, but stochastically through this mechanism of somatic expansion, uh, there is a mosaic status in the brains of HD patients that at some point reaches a threshold 
um, that triggers disease. And this explains the delay from birth to the beginning of a circuit-wide dysfunction that we characterize with the clinical onset of Huntington's disease. Now, the path pathogenic length of the somatic expansion that triggers this demise is unknown, either at a cellular level or at a circuit level, and that's areas where we need to focus on in the future. Okay, so in terms of therapeutic development, uh, there are three main areas that can be um, um, sort of reflected upon in the current therapeutic landscape. The first one is obviously Huntington-directed therapeutics, and I will be covering most of that because they're the most advanced programs. Uh, modifiers of progression focusing on this DNA mismatch repair genes. So this is a new area, but it's advancing quickly. And then areas that I'm not going to discuss, but that are heavily represented in or have been traditionally represented in, in the pipeline are um, symptomatic treatments or strategies like stem cell transplantation to restore affected circuits. And I think this has been covered in a previous lecture by Ann Roser. So I will not talk about this in this talk. Uh, obviously, we're very interested in understanding how Huntington affects circuits and how the circuits get reflected in the symptoms that we call Huntington's disease. Okay, developing therapies from generics to treatments. I'm going to highlight some complexities that are explaining where we are right now, the good and the bad, and presumably where we need to go and how we need to address some of these uh, you know, complexities. Um, there is also the complexity of trying to develop disease progression biomarkers that enable us to interpret clinical trial results and particularly to move earlier and earlier in the disease. And finally, some significant limitations that are imposed not by biology but by technology. And I think in the case of Huntington lowering, it is these technology limitations that are the biggest barrier to break if we are to develop um, effective therapeutics. So, the road to a therapy that targets Huntington seems clear. We have a single gene affecting 100% of all the individuals who suffer from Huntington's disease. It's a clear road ahead. Unfortunately, I think as we see later, the road looks more like this. And I live in Los Angeles, I'm used to this complexity, but it is a bit disheartening to find out with the recent um, uh, failures in clinical trials targeting Huntington that the road may not be so straightforward. There are many different exit points, many different things we need to consider, lots of traffic. In addition, I think lately, and I will explain some of the difficulties in seeing the road ahead, given the context of the recent failures, how we can hopefully move away from this uh, foggy highway into something that is much more straightforward and clear, and what, as a field, we need to do in that regard. Okay, first aspect, molecular, molecular complexity. So, you know, we're used to think of Huntington's disease as a single gene that has a single type of mutation, the CAG repeat in exon 1. The structure of any gene is composed of introns and exons. There are 67 exons that code for the full-length Huntington protein, and there are introns that get spliced out during post-transcriptional processing um, of the Huntington gene, and everybody, I think, is familiar with the fact that depending on the length of the CAG, you will develop either juvenile Huntington's or adult onset Huntington's. However, the picture in the last few years has become a lot more complex in terms of what is the protein that causes disease and different versions of this protein and why these things might matter in the context of therapeutic approaches. So the first one is that we know that there are structural differences that occur at the level of the DNA, at the level of the RNA, and at the level of the protein. And I think it's becoming more complex to think that these symptoms of the disease are only arising from changes at the protein level. There are clear changes at the RNA level, and again, this has been shown here by the lab of Kevin Weeks, suggesting that the expansion triggers a different conformation of RNA that can get recognized by specific RNA binding proteins, and that has potentially profound consequences for the type of protein and the amount of the protein that can be expressed in a cell. In addition, at the DNA level, because of the somatic expansion hypothesis, clearly enzymes that regulate mismatch repair can recognize the structural differences in the DNA. And whether that has a significant implication by itself, in addition to the length of the polyglutamate stretch in the protein remains to be seen. But I think this adds uh, at least two layers of complexity to this problem. Finally, uh, at the level of post-transcriptional control, once the Huntington mRNA um, is made, 
we now realize that there are different versions that occur through either alternative splicing of an intin or incomplete splicing. And some of these events seem to happen uh, as a consequence of the expansion of the CAG repeat. So um, normally a single transcript um, um, in order to be translated requires an addition of the polyadenylation site in a normal full length Huntington. The work that Jill Bates uh, has shown that because of the expansion of the CAG repeat in exon one, there is a incomplete splicing, there is a recognition of uh, potential cryptic polyadenylation sites in the intronic sequences that leads to an mRNA that only contains um, exon 1 and parts of intron 1 leading to a very toxic uh, exon 1 protein and that has been shown unambiguously to happen in almost every mouse model of Huntington's disease and have pathological significance in the models. It's been shown to be detectable in human juvenile cases with a large CAG repeat but it is unclear whether it happens in adult onset. Now, we need to put this in the context of the somatic expansion hypothesis by which a, a stochastic expansion in some neurons will reach a threshold by which this mechanism may become um, may become significant in terms of mediating the cellular toxicity. And I will explain why I'm talking about this in the context of the therapies that are currently in development. Okay. So the question becomes, what do we lower? Do we lower the mutant only? Do we lower both alleles of Huntington? Does that matter for efficacy or for safety? And do we now have to worry about therapies that target the exon one pure protein rather than the full length? Um, so let me just tackle the, the aspect of the Huntington um, normal function. So it's clear in the mouse, and I think it's becoming clear in humans, that Huntington, the normal Huntington allele is required um, uh, uh, during during development, uh, but the mutant, uh, at least in mice, can rescue this, and we know this because um, individuals with HD that have two copies of the expanded Huntington Huntington mutant Huntington gene are alive and well until they develop the disease, and therefore, um, this seems to support the fact that the expans expansion of the CAG repeat uh, did not affect the normal function of Huntington. Second thing is we now know of a few individuals that have a single copy of normal Huntington, 50%, and those individuals seem to be fine. Okay, so 50% seems to be tolerated in humans as well as in mice. Um, however, there are uh, a lot of data in the mouse and some data in humans suggesting that individuals that are born with two different mutations in Huntington that lead to a very low level of expression, maybe 20%, um, have a developmental disorder that affects the brain and other tissues, suggesting that when you lower Huntington too much, at least from conception, this is not good. Okay, so is there evidence today that in adult um, humans, when you lower Huntington, this is a therapeutic risk? The answer is not clear, but we have a lot of reasons to be very worried about this once you go below a, thres a certain threshold. Okay, I'm going to switch to circuit circuit aspects um, in terms of complexity because I think this is very important, particularly when it comes to gene therapy approaches, and I think in the context of symptomatic treatments. So, the first thing is that people have talked to you already about um, the uh, extent of this function outside of the striatum, and I would say outside of the basal ganglia. I consider Huntington's disease a multiple uh, system disorder, and this clear functional imaging, uh, structural imaging, and histological postmortem analysis that shows that there is widespread degeneration. And all of the work that we've done, I think, in, in preclinical species suggests that this is not a striatal or a basal ganglia disease. There's many other contributors to the pathology, in addition to the fact that there's a lot of ad adaptive and maladaptive changes that happen during the lifetime of an individual that has the mutation. So this has to be kept in mind that a therapy that has a restricted uh, distribution is likely to affect the types of symptoms based on circuitry alterations. And this is exemplified here um, for simplicity just in the basal ganglia, but it's very clearly understood in, in primates, in, in mammals in general, and in humans, that there are subdivisions of the basal ganglia circuits that start in a, in a closed loop from the cortex to the striatum, output nuclei of the basal ganglia, back to the thalamus and cortex, and that these functions at the level of 
frank degeneration, loss of axonal connections or neurons or synaptic deficits in the circuits can really impact and explain a lot of the symptoms that are associated with, let's say, motor circuit dysfunction such as chorea, dystonia, uh, rigidity, and in the context of cognition and affective uh, disorders, it's clear, for example, the ventral striatal circuits and the limbic circuits in the context of um, apathy, compulsive behavior, and so forth. So these things have to be kept in mind that therapies that affect only a subset of these circuits based on the anatomy of, of, of this of these circuits needs to be taken into consideration uh, with a great level of detail. Okay, so I'm going to summarize the current therapies targeting Huntington, uh, which are the most advanced, as I've mentioned before. So in, um, in a simplified way, the Huntington gene gets transcribed into mRNA. Uh, that mRNA gets processed through splicing and other mechanisms, gets translated into a protein. The protein is prone to aggregate in solution to be cleaved by um, proteases um, and in the case of the exon one product there are different versions of Huntington protein that can aggregate more or less readily. Uh, the therapeutic strategies target each one of these aspects. The most proximal to the lesion is the only DNA therapeutic at the moment, which has been developed by Sangamon Takeda uh, with an AAV CFP. Um, the next uh, bulk of the programs at the level of molecular therapies with antisense oligonucleotides or AAV dependent mRNAs or SIRNAs, and these are the companies that are developing programs, work all at the level of mRNA and post transcriptional processing. There are also uh, recent programs in small molecules that affect at the level of splicing, and I will describe what these are later. And finally, uh, much more delayed, there are some protein degradation strategies taking advantage of some aggregate binder uh, high affinity small molecules that we have developed at CHDI. Okay, so this is the pipeline. This is a complex table. I hope that you can pause the presentation at your own free time and see this in more depth. But basically, I just wanted to show um, the different programs and the different modalities. The first one I wanted to show is the first and most advanced programs that went to the clinic. These are antisense oligonucleotides. These are DNA um, um, molecules that bind mRNA and lead to its degradation that are administered intrathecally every four, eight, or 16 weeks. Um, and the most advanced program was the IONES Roche ASO that went to phase three. Um, the next modality is AAV driven modality that requires an intraparenchymal administration, mostly targeting the codit and putamen, but not these two things. They're different agents, different therapeutic agents, microRNAs or CFPs, but also companies have chosen based on their. Uh, selection criteria, different serotypes that have different properties in terms of distribution. Um, the next set of programs that are making their way into the clinic are SIRNAs. Again, these are uh, molecules that uh, also lead to the degradation, albeit by a different mechanism from antisense oligonucleotides, um, and are delivered either intrathecally or ICV. So we're going to have an issue comparing the potential efficacy and safety of those two uh, programs. And then finally, splicing modulators, which are all drugs that get everywhere in the body. Okay, the ionis rose was stopped in phase three due to adverse events. The WAVE programs were stopped due to lack of adequate responses in phase two, and Voyager stopped development of their programs. So the most advanced programs, with the exception of the Unicure AMT-130 program, have stopped, and the rest are all going into a late preclinical stage, hope, hoping to get to the clinic in 2022. Okay, let's talk about what they target. So if we just focus in now on molecules that are allele selective, which is certainly my preference, uh, there's only two. The WAVE program, and again, the WAVE programs that went into the clinic were canceled. The WAVE just announced a third ASO molecule that seems to be allele selective because it targets a single nucleotide change in, uh, that is phased with the mutant expansion. And even though it won't target every single patient with Huntington's, it will target about 30% of Huntington's patients that have that particular polymorphism. That's going to start clinical studies in 2022. The only other program that targets the mutant allele selective is the Sangamo CFP. If we focus about exon 1 proteins, then the only one that we know for sure today that targets that protein is the Unicure program, the Sangamo and the Alnylam programs, because 
both the Unicure and Alilam are targeting uh, the mRNA at the level of exon 1 and therefore it should, it should lead to the degradation of both the full length and exon 1. So if this matter, a lot of the other programs are going to have an issue because they will not lower exon 1, including the oral drugs. So this complexity at the molecular level is highlighting a level of complexity in the clinical interpretation of the, of, of the studies that are ongoing. Um, and it's thrown some fog into the road that we envisioned 10 years ago, what we didn't know about these recent findings. Okay, let me just take a, a, a brief detour and, and, and do a comparison with another neurodegenerative indication, spinal muscular atrophy, that is basically using similar um, um, uh, methodologies, uh, modalities, ASOs, viral delivery, and small molecules, and, and, and indeed the small molecules that are being used for Huntington's were discovered because they were they, uh, they were developed for spinal muscular atrophy. In this case, for SMA, these programs have been successful. Uh, Ristiplam is an orally administered splicing modulator that distributes all throughout the body. And uh, you can see it here in this cartoon on the right. And um, that works at the level of splicing, uh, leading to an increase in uh, SMN2 expression throughout the body. And that drug has been approved for infants uh, with SMA and it seems to be clinically efficacious at least for a certain period of time. Then there are other modalities, for example, nucinersen, which is an ASO um, developed by IONIS, uh, that's also been approved um, and also shown when administered into the spinal cord uh, to show significant benefits. And there are other studies with AAV. So the challenges that we're experiencing for Huntington's disease are not unique to Huntington's, but the circuits that we're trying to explore in Huntington's are much more widespread and complex compared to SMA or maybe compared to, compared to ALS. And I think we need to keep in mind these comparisons to learn from other indications that maybe are being more advanced in the context of getting clinical positive signals in their trials. And I will return to this in the future. Okay, why do we believe that mutant Huntington lowering can work? I've told you about the complexities molecularly. I've told you about the complexities in developing these therapies clinically. We must be very confident that Huntington lowering can work in order for us to persevere. And it's certainly my personal belief that we intervene um, with therapies early enough and uh, broad, broadly enough in the circuits affected, it will work. Okay, there's a lot of papers, including from, from our own work, starting uh, 20 years ago, uh, more or less, with genetic models uh, showing that if you can turn off mutant Huntington broadly throughout the brain, and certainly certain neurons of the basal ganglia, you can recover function, not just to slow the progression of the disease. And that is clear, clearly my belief. Um, What's reversible? We've taken this approach by analyzing and developing assays for the core features of the disease in preclinical species, uh, mostly in rodents, aggregation pathology, synaptic alterations, um, neuronal deficits at the level of connectivity, um, in some cases, uh, death of those cells, and at the level of the nuclear, um, chromatin and transcriptional changes. And largely, what we, find, what we find today is that if you can stop mutant Huntington significantly, 50% or higher, you can have sustained uh, improvements in pretty much every cell that we've looked at. Okay, the strategy has been to lower mutant Huntington in already diseased cells. We're not interested in preventing the disease, we're interested in, in understanding how uh, to reverse, whether, whether mutant Huntington can reverse those symptoms. And then we look at all of these parameters. Um, the animal models that we've used are the knock-in uh, Q175, which includes a, a knock-in of human exon with 175 repeats. And these animals start with no disease, about five or six months of age. They start developing uh, circuit-based uh, abnormalities, uh, transcriptional changes, aggregation, and then they move on to very significant um, uh, sort of behavioral and, and white matter changes in this model. So we typically do studies either beginning prior prior to disease or in the mid-disease course and try to understand at this age whether we reverse the symptoms. Um, what I wanted to say is at the level of the uh, mouse uh, circuits affected in, in Huntington's that where we look at the level of the striatum, at the level of glio, at the level of neurons, uh, uh, at the level of corticostriatal corrections um, and in the output nuclei, 
there are alterations. And this happens in the absence of neurodegeneration. The cells don't die. So clearly you can have uh, symptoms and dysfunctions caused by mutant Huntington uh, without killing the cells. And that gives us at least some hope that while cells are alive in the human context, if you stop mutant Huntington, you can actually rescue those deficits. And in fact, this is what we've been doing um, with this mutant Huntington selective CFP that works at the level of the DNA. We put this into viruses, we inject into the striatum, in this case of the mouse, and you can see in cells that are expressing the zinc finger protein here in red, you have very little aggregation pathology with EM48 as compared to the control lateral hemisphere. So it clearly can stop the histopathology. And even though I don't have enough time to, to show you this, what well, we do experiments with optogenetics or electrical recordings and stimulation paradigms in the mouse, we can clearly rescue most of the um, synaptic physiology deficits at the level of plasticity, at the level of connectivity um, in the striatal projection mirror. So everything looks good from this perspective. We've taken this in collaboration with many different labs, uh, academic labs, to show that mutant Huntington has cell autonomous effects throughout the brain. It's not limited to projection neurons in the striatum. It's involved in astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, interneurons, and other cells outside of the striatum, such as the globus pallidus and the subthalamic nucleus. However, the changes that we see are some are cell autonomous, some are not. Some changes at the level of connectivity seem to be compensatory in nature, and therefore, we really need to understand where we need to lower Huntington and what's changing in response to uh, an intervention strategy. However, most of the circuits outside of the of the striatum, the ventral limbic circuits in the striatum, the cortical thalamic circuits are all completely unexplained, unexplored. Hippocampal deficits, cerebellar circuit uh, uh, changes in the context of striatal dysfunction are completely unexplored. So we, there's a lot more to know. Okay, so you know, I've, I've, I've hopefully in five minutes, I've been able to, to tell you that I feel very comfortable that if we intervene with Huntington lowering therapies early enough, um, particularly mutant Huntington uh, therapies, um, that we have hopes that this can work. So how do we actually take this information at a cellular level or a circuit level and apply it to the clinic? So we know Huntington suppression can change cellular uh, alterations. Uh, those have potential circuit alteration changes. And um, if we restore those, that should be um, leading to a functional improvement. So how do we measure this in trials? And this has been a focus from my group, certainly for over 10 years. There are two different approaches that we've taken. One is just measuring Huntington itself as a target that tells us where in the brain we're lowering uh, its expression. And finally, we, we that's just not sufficient. We want to understand how much we need to lower Huntington to have a biological response in those circuits. And the initial data we've acquired is by using PET uh, with striatal markers or synaptic markers. And now we're moving into other measures, including CSF and structural and functional MRI. Okay, CHDI for the last decade has been working to develop small molecules that bind oligomeric or aggregated Huntington. These are very potent molecules. They are orally bioavailable, brain penetrant, and we developed them with the perspective of uh, imaging Huntington in the brain. These are the first papers that have been published this year. There's a clinical study ongoing with the first tracer, a C11 molecule called 180, uh, in the image with a Huntington study that's being currently um, attested in, in Europe. Uh, this is the data that we obtain in an interventional study. Again, this is uh, uh, mutant Huntington uh, binding over time, you can see from three months to 10 months that there is a clear signal in the brain in red and that the injected hemisphere with the CFP where we're lowering mutant Huntington uh, is devoid of the signal. And you can see this when we normalize one hemisphere versus the other, that you can see a diminution in the binding of the tracer where Huntington has been suppressed. And you see a concomitant increase in PD10 expression, which is a market of striatal alteration. So you can lower Huntington, you can detect it with our imaging tracer, but you can also detect a restoration of the cellular alterations as imaged by dopamine receptors and PD10. Okay, there are other response biomarkers um, that haven't been explored in the context of an interventional study, such as encephaline 
dynorphin and neurofilament that are shown to be just like PD10 PET or D2PET very early on in the disease, approximately 10, 15 years before motor diagnosis, you begin to see in the pre-HD condition, you begin to see significant alterations. And these are the types of markers that are gonna be explored during the prodromal stages to tell you that not only are you having an effect during symptomatic stages of the disease, but hopefully that you can track this as a way of changing the course of the disease before you can interrogate um, functional improvement in, in, in clinically employed uh, tests. Okay, technology limitations, um, distribution and allele selectivity. And this is the aspect that worries me the most, mostly because I don't have any ability to influence the development of better technology, even though almost every company working in gene therapy is trying to do this. So let me just take you through the uh, uh, antisense oligonucleotide therapeutics targeted in Huntington. First one is the phase two study that was published in New England Journal of Medicine led by Sarah Tabrisi was a landmark study for the first time we were able to show that Huntington lowering could be detected after a therapeutic intervention in a dose and time dependent manner. This is a feature article in Science where people were extraordinarily excited about this funding. However, I think that enthusiasm was premature. The trial was stopped in phase three and this has been devastating to the patient community. So, so why did this happen? And what can we learn from these studies so that we can improve in the future? So let me just tell you that both of the programs with ASOs have now been uh, terminated. Um, this is a picture of um, a monkey study that was published a while ago, where in brown is the distribution of the ASOs. And even though Roche and Iones have done some modeling based on these studies, the doses that need to be administered in order to reach um, with enough level of um, occupancy of the target and pharmacodynamic effect in monkeys um, is, is very high. And I think this may have been part of the issue that uh, the trial was stopped. And in order particularly to reach the basal ganglia, the doses need to be extremely high. That's what they went to 120 milligrams. So this is data that uh, Roche presented at the CHDI conference. And you can see that there were already signs in the phase one, two study. This was published also in the New England Journal, where after about 85 days looking at CSF neurofilament and other markers, you could see an elevation that was dose dependent in the 90 and 120 20 milligrams. The same, they were significant, maybe not so dose dependent, but ventricular volume changes over time, highlighting that there was a problem at the level of an inflammatory uh, response. In the open label extension study, where they took additional patients and monitored them over time, I'm just showing you here in the four week uh, dosing that you can see a very significant increase in neurofilament that lasts a few months. And that is more pronounced with the more frequent administration. So in this in these studies, um, we were already seeing signs that there's a problem with these therapies. Now, whether the problem is due to a pro-inflammatory uh, effect of the ASO is due to accumulations versus an effect on potential on target Huntington lowering, that's unclear. But this was clearly manifested in the interim analysis that led to the termination of the phase three studies where they were able to show that in the uh, eight week dosing group beginning at about 37 or 10 months, um, you could see a worsening of the total functional capacity that led to the termination. So at the moment, we don't have any more information from Roche. I'm sure they will be forthcoming, but this highlights that either high dose of ASOs at the level of, 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 of this population, it's not tolerated, and this may be a modality issue. We will find out with the WAVE uh, program. Uh, and this may have broader implications than just this, uh, this particular agent, um, or it could be an adverse effect to Huntington lowering, but we don't know uh, whether that's the case. Okay, if we now go back to the um, ASO studies that, that uh, were conducted for spinal muscular atrophy, this is a figure from this paper, they were showing that the concentration of the ASOs, and this is in infants, at, at the dose that they were used, which is much lower than the Huntington's program, but you can see that there was a graded, a graded distribution. There was very little oligo 
in the cortex, very little oligo in the in the cervical spinal cord, um, arguing that there's going to be a gradient of distribution. And again, this is for post-mortem studies in infants that die from SMA. And again, if you look at the blue bars, which are the expression or the regulation of the SMN2 splicing event, there's nothing in the cortex available in the cervical spinal cord. And, and therefore, it highlights again that you need to be careful with models and we need to have additional ways of verifying the, the extent of distribution of pharmaco pharmacological effect in the regions that we think are important for therapy. Okay. The AAVs have a different type of problem. And again, um, the AAVs are administered intraparenchymally uh, with different viruses that can um, expand through the brain via transport. And the most advanced program, again, is the Unicure AMT-130 uh, program. And uh, data from their paper suggests that when you inject into caudate putamen with this virus, which is able to be transported back into areas that are connected with the basal ganglia, you can see that there is very significant a broad spread suppression of Huntington in this transgenic mini pig that we generated. Um, a word of caution is that in the striatum areas, you can see that the extent of suppression of Huntington um, with this agent is very profound. It's about 80 or 90 percent. So if there is a possibility for a loss of function phenotype, this is a uh, this, this is a potential risk. Now, in these studies that were used for um, the GLP DOC studies for regulatory filings, uh, the mini pig Huntington is not targeted by this agent. So you're only measuring the effect here on the mutant transgenic gene. And this is a caveat of these studies. I think it's important to qualify this. Um, more importantly, uh, in, the, in the context of translational work, uh, in these same studies, looking at CSF Huntington levels, you can see that, yes, there is a pharmacological effect of this therapy, but that the level of CSF that is ref the level of Huntington lowering in CSF is not perfectly correlated with the level of lowering that is seen parenchymally because this therapy is administered intraparenchymally in the striatum. So um, CSF may not be a good surrogate for what's happening clinically in deep brain structures. Additionally, most people have begun to explore neurofilament as a, as a clear pathological progression marker, but in the context of interventions such as potentially ASOs, and in this case, AAV um, uh, microRNAs, you can see that there is a significant elevation just in response to the intervention itself, surgery plus AAV. And, and I think we have to be very careful using neurofilament on its own as a marker um, that may indicate a pharmacological effect. Okay, so how can we better interpret this in the future? What things can the field do? And the field means you neurologists in training, neurologists uh, and, and us, people involved in drug discovery. The first thing is that we better, we need to better evaluate agent distribution. And, you know, for example, for ASOs, uh, you can do uh, contrast MRI uh, to really assess the extent of distribution in humans. And I think that should be done. Um, we also need to have regional suppression of Huntington lowering by looking at the Huntington pet traces that we've developed and also cell and circuit specific markers based on your predicted distribution. And finally, we should plan prospectively to collect tissues of individuals who die, particularly those who have um, been received an AAB therapy that can last for the rest of the individual's life. And I would argue that we need to start considering in the incorporation of very aggressive cases of Huntington, such as juvenile cases in these studies. Juvenile HD is not considered at all in therapeutic interventions. I think that's a shame from a humane perspective, but it's also a shame because given the aggressive nature of the disease, those types of studies can be a very instructive to understand the distribution and the pharmacological effect of these therapies. Okay, so all of these can be circumvented if we have small molecules that went everywhere. And in the last three years, several companies have begun to develop such such uh, new therapeutic agents. So this is a new class. And again, this was a serendipitous discovery following the uh, SMA uh, story. So drugs that were able to modulate the splicing of the SMN2 genes were tested for selectivity. And it so happened that, for example, the Novartis drug Branaplan, which is in late stages uh, development for SMA happened to lower Huntington. It turns out that Ristiplam, the Roche molecule that is approved for SMA, does not modulate Huntington levels. So, but Pranaplan did. 
and several other companies in, uh, were able to identify that SMA directed drugs were able to dose dependently lower Huntington expression at the level of RNA. So this has led to not only Novartis, but several companies um, developing their own drugs for Huntington's. PTC and Novartis are the two most advanced programs and Skyhawk, another biotech company, is in preclinical development. And all of these molecules work at the level of uh, modulating the splicing of a uh, a well understood region of the Huntington gene. Uh, the normal splicing between exon 49 and 50 is altered by these drugs that essentially lead to a misplacing event that um, a pseudo exon gets incorporated into the mRNA. The pseudo exon contains um, stop codons um, that lead to termination of. Uh, you know, Huntington transcription and translation and therefore uh, a loss of the protein. Okay, this is just that data from internal molecules with Rana plant showing that oral dosing for 21 days is very efficient in um, lowering Huntington, particularly in peripheral tissues, 80 to 90 percent at these doses, both in liver and muscle, and a significant diminution at the protein level um, in the brain, all throughout the brain. However, remember that if we have an issue with lowering Huntington systemically in some organ system outside of the brain, because the drugs are more uh, efficacious at lowering Huntington uh, due to exposure um, in, in liver versus, versus brain, this may limit the tolerability of these molecules. The other thing that is good about these drugs is that they are reversible. You can see here a study after, two, after 15 day dosing of prana plan and then uh, doing a washout that it takes about a week or 10 days in the different tissues to restore normal levels. And again, this enables small molecules to be much more tractable if, if there are advanced events because you can titrate the dose and turn it off. Okay, where, where are we uh, collectively here? Uh, we're trying to improve the therapeutic index. These molecules have um, on mechanism toxicity, not necessarily due to Huntington lowering, but because they do modulate splicing of other genes. Uh, and uh, both us, as well as many other companies, are trying to improve the therapeutic index uh, by traditional drug discovery and biological means. And we're really trying to understand um, the precise mechanism of action so that we can develop better molecules. So this is a, a set of programs that are going to be very exciting to follow clinically, but we expect they will be improved backup molecules making their way to the clinic um, in the next few years. Okay, so what about the future? I've told you about the challenges. I've told you about how I think we can uh, circumvent some of the problems that we have, and hopefully people will take this seriously. And I think in, in terms of the future, from my perspective, we have um, uh, a very weak portfolio when it comes to modulating mutant Huntington. I think lowering both alleles of Huntington is going to be leading to those uh, limiting toxicities that we need to overcome. Um, I think we need to develop modalities and approaches other than Huntington, just in case we are not able to circumvent these issues. And the next tranche of programs is going to be targeting somatic instability. And finally, um, my biggest worry is that if these approaches, which are um, very difficult to overcome in terms of the technology limitations um, that we don't have symptomatic therapies that can help patients today, particularly in cognition and apathy. And I think in Huntington's is happening the same thing that happened in the context of, of Alzheimer's disease, where people are moving away from understanding circuit, circuit changes, developing therapies, because we believe that targeting the cause of the disease or the genetic components of the disease will be enough. And so far, both Huntington's and Alzheimer's, and I would say any other indication other than SMA, have been unsuccessful. So if you are a company or you're a doctor, don't forget about symptomatic therapies, please. Okay, in terms of uh, future work, RNA directed small molecules, there's now evidence suggesting that uh, for other indications that you can modulate the expression of genes by um, directing uh, small molecules to translational or uh, degrading the RNA by finding or exploiting structural differences in the mutant Huntington RNA um, uh, structure that we're beginning to explore. And there are several companies beginning to work on this. And at the protein level, as I told you, we develop uh, mutant Huntington selective pet tracers. These small molecules when coupled to um, um, other, other uh, chemical entities that direct 
a protein for degradation are being explored at the moment that this is being done internally at CHDI and in collaboration with Arvinas and other companies. And I, I think we're going to see a lot more work trying to degrade the protein the moment it's being made. This will be amenable to small molecules as well, which will circumvent the normal Huntington lowering toxicity effects that we might encounter in the clinic. I think finally, in terms of somatic instability, the most advanced program is being driven by triplet. This is an ASO molecule that can inhibit the MSH3 expression. MSH3 has been shown quite convincingly in humans to modulate the rate of progression. And it's clear that it works at least preclinical the level of somatic instability and a loss of function on MSH3 uh, genetically or pharmacologically with ASO is able to hold somatic expansion. This has been shown in vivo. This is a study. Uh, in, this is a study in in in, um, in mice showing that you can very efficiently block somatic instability when you administer an ASO lower in Huntington. And this program is in a late stages preclinical. Hopefully, going to the clinic in 2020. So I just wanted to conclude this way and just saying patients are here, there is a new generation of children at risk for Huntington's disease and all of the work that we need to do collectively has also to be put in context of what we need to do in the future to ensure that future generations of people at risk for Huntington's disease have a better therapeutic uh, uh, treatment options. I wanted to thank all of my collaborators and thank you for listening. Um, I can take any questions now. Thank you so much.